I asked Dr. Alfano if he could please give us some numbers to help facilitate the table. And without delay, he recommended some of his top educational leaders to serve in that role. And they, they accepted and they set up to the challenge. And I'd like to recognize them this evening for the great work that they've done. I'd like to also recognize tonight, although she's not here with us this evening, is Sherry Kampowski. Sherry did a phenomenal job of having those 25 tables set up. Uh, to our surprise, the morning of the conference, we had a delivery. Sherry came on site like that, and in seconds notice, the delivery was didn't interfere with the conference at all. Uh, and of course, the delivery came in through the door where the conference was, and uh, Sherry handled it perfectly. Her and her team moved it through, and it was gone. So I'd like to thank her and recognize her for her outstanding efforts. I'd like to recognize the people who are here, and if I may. <coughs> Oh, absolutely. Okay. I'd like to make a few comments before uh, we give out the certificates. My name is Elaine Davis. I'm a retired early retirement, I'd like you to know. <laughs> High school principal <laughs> of 11 years in Montclair, New Jersey. And it warmed my heart to drive into this field and hear the band practicing and see the color guard. And um, those are the things I really miss about being back in the school. But one thing I learned during those years is my job was very isolating. Even though I had a lot of people around me, a lot of public that placed a lot of good demands on us, we, we really strived hard to go above the bar. But I wanted this Turnaround Leadership Network, when I was invited to come into the department, to fulfill some of the needs that I was not as fortunate as having. And that was a network of other colleagues who I could trust, who I could have met, I know the state says we all have to have personal learning plans for students, but how in the world am I going to do that? How do you introduce it to staff? How do you make it not seem like an add-on? And these are things that other administrators can help you with, and that's why we decided to form the Turnaround Leadership Network. And it's been a phenomenal year. You know, sometimes you can plan a party, and if nobody comes, then you have to say, maybe you didn't have the right topic or the right time. This was a, a time when we planned this leadership initiative and statewide we've had over 2,000 administrators uh, coming and participating and now superintendents are asking for us to provide them with support. I can't say enough about people like Tom who came to me when I first came back to the department and said, this is exactly what I want to do. And I think what we're trying to model is what we hope other leaders will do. When you have good people around you who are talented, energetic, eager, we should make a way for them to be able to have their voice and their talents uh, showcased. And that's what we've done. But the Sarahville School District has just been the, the foundation and the bedrock for our launching off statewide. We say, look at what we were able to do in Sarahville, and now we can do that across the state. So I can't thank this community enough, and that's why we wanted to come tonight and to give these certificates of recognition because we don't take the support for granted and we hope you'll see more this year that will improve your administrators too. You're all participating uh, as well as uh, administrators throughout the central region of the state. So Tom, let's recognize those who, uh, let's first get the superintendent and Ed if we could. <laughs> you can come forward. It's a, a State Department of Certificate. It doesn't say one of the first initial supporters, but it should. and. Uh, if they were the Olympics, we'd give you a gold medal. So thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we have some other uh, staff here and uh, administrators we'd like to recognize. Sure. I'd like to recognize Carla Sutherland, who contributed to a great deal in the conference, and also Carla, who serves on the advisory council. Carla, thank you so much for your input and help us. Thank you so much. Richard, Richard, uh, Eberhardt, I'm sorry, Richard. Richard, thank you for serving as a soul leader. Uh, your thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Marilyn Zeichner. Marilyn, thank you for coming as a soul leader. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you. Thomas Gentile.
John, John, uh, okay. okay. <laughs> John, I'm sorry, John. That's okay, JK. JK, that's all right, no, it's JK. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge Sandy Paul. Sandy did an outstanding job with our technology needs. Uh, boy, the conference would not have been anything without your technology expertise, setting everything up for us. Uh, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you very much. Carolyn Corvino. Uh, Carolyn helped us prepare the brochure for the Office of Leadership Development. On the brochure, you'll see a little picture of a bird. The bird is our logo that was created by a student of the Long Branch School District. And Carolyn helped us to put that bird on our brochure. And it's part of our, our, our uh, literature that we distribute throughout the state. So Carolyn did a phenomenal job for that. We'll leave her her brochure here. We really want to thank her for that. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize Bonnie Brady. Bonnie worked with me throughout the conference. Uh, Bonnie, thank you. That conference would not have happened again without you. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Thank you. And lastly, Mr. President, I'd like to present a certificate of appreciation to the Sable School, School Board for supporting us and welcoming us into your district and allowing us to use facilities and also use the talented educational leaders you have in this building in the district. Thank you. So I just want to mention one last thing before I leave, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the work that Edward Aguilis has done for these initiatives. Uh, Edward presented with the Office of Leadership Development at approximately two conferences statewide. Last year, we were invited to present at the principal, the superintendent's conference, the yearly conference in Atlantic City, and Dr. Alfano allowed Ed, Edward to come with us. Uh, Edward also presented with us last week at the New Jersey Juvenile Justice Convention, which was also held in Atlantic City. I'm starting to see a trend here, but believe me, we go down, we present, then we go home. <laughs> the presenting with Edward at these conferences brought a realistic approach that I cannot give. Uh, Edward has the practical experience as an educational leader in the building, and what he shared with the audience was just priceless. And the evaluations of every conference I presented with Ed have been extremely, extremely positive. Thank you again for this opportunity. We just wanted to come out tonight and acknowledge the educational leaders and thank them all for supporting us and our work. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's talking to you. Thank you sir, for your time and your kind words about our administration, our team. We're well aware of their abilities and professionalism and, and the kind words about our school district. Thank you. Thank you so Excellent. much. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to. I, I also want to say thank you, but get used to this room because this is where the next. Uh, <laughs> workshop is going to be. So it's going to hold about 700 people. Great. So uh, in the summer, we're all ready for you. And we even have a full kitchen back there. <laughs> so uh, thanks very much. I appreciate everything you guys do. Thank, thank you, Elaine. Thank, thank you, Tom. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And congratulations to everybody. Um, Mr. President, I'm going to move right through uh, into my presentation. And uh, I think it's a little too loud, but that's all right. Maybe I'll move over here. Thank you, Mr. DeAndre. That's good. Uh, I'm quickly going to go through this. Uh, this is uh, a one of our the board goals that uh, we're going to do a little bit more with strategic planning and New Jersey QSAC, which is our monitoring program. So what I'd like to do today is, is to go over our strategic plan. And our strategic plan is, you can move to the next frame, uh, these are some of the members of our strategic plan. Remember, this is our uh, guide to really what goes on in the district. And I'd like to acknowledge each of the members. Ed Aglis is on it. Ed, George Bauman. Linda got, uh, wasn't feeling well at the end of the day. She would have been here. Uh, a video is on it. DeAndrea, Carol Dumpy, Claire Kaczynski, who I think is here. She gave me the, the I know I wouldn't have this if it wasn't for Claire. Donna Jakubic is here. Kathy Riley, I believe, is not, but uh, she is on the committee. And uh, Carla, as well as Marilyn Zeichner. Those are the people we meet once a month. We create some very um, Atlantic reports, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about it as we go on. And of course, without the support of the uh, Board of Education. Um, what is the strategic plan? Quickly, it's a roadmap. It's all our goals, which are six of them. 
or our activities, how we get there, and how we're going to assess them. It's a team effort. We do action plans every month. We do two of them. We give them out to the board. They basically, we explain exactly how we're meeting these goals. Second thing, goals will serve as the focal point of the program, and you can see it provides decision-making practices of the district, and it really guides what we do in the entire, for the entire year. This strategic plan has been in existence for, I believe, three years, and it took one year to construct. So it's been around for about four years, and it's still going strong, and it's, we play it out until the year 2011. Goal number one, student performance. We're not going to do a whole lot on that today, tonight, because what we're going to do is next meeting, October 20th, we'll be on New Jersey QSAC and do most of our performance end at that meeting. In that goal, there are 18 different action plans and sub-plans that probably, there's at least 70 different methods of how we're going to reach each and every goal that deals with performance. Could be anything from standardized tests, could be uh, all the, all the uh, tests that the, the children take during the year, and then there are 16 specific benchmarks, which we'll talk a little bit about next week, but uh, actually the next board meeting. And that's our first is performance. Safe and clean environment facilities. I just want to go through, this is our second goal, and it's really one of our big ones. When I came here 10 years ago, we were extremely overcrowded. We built basically a brand new school, about $28 million. We received approximately $7.5 million in state aid. And we, dealt, we increased the size of the high school by about one third. This is approximately a $50 million project with about $14 million that we received. I came from many districts that did nothing. This district really planned forward. And I need, really need to say that the glass is not half full, but it's overflowing. This is a state-of-the-art building. We should be very proud that what we have around us, and it's just a, a magnificent situation. So the two referenda that we passed, I really have to thank the public. I have to thank the board for having the vision. And let me tell you something, it's really worked out well. Capital projects, we probably did about, since I've been here, over $20 million worth of capital projects. As you can see, the middle school is a completely different building from what I came into. We've really done a lot of work on the middle school, we've done a lot of work on the elementary schools, and subsequently, we are doing a lot of renovations in the high school itself. So we're really making the buildings very safe, very clean, and I'll tell you the truth, the cleanliness report we got some very good vibes on the cleanliness report that each principal fills out at the end of uh, each month. And this month, the cleanliness reports and just the, the uh, buildings in general, I think, are much cleaner. And I really think that Sherry Kaprowski and Dennis Pantoliano and all the custodians are doing a very good job trying to keep these buildings up to some. Um, emergency management plans. We basically lead the county in emergency management plans. We have pandemic plans, which we've been working on because of, God forbid, all this H1N1 stuff that you've been hearing. We have all types of crisis plans. We have, God forbid, if we need lockdowns, if we need evacuations. Matter of fact, we're doing a state-of-the-art drill tomorrow at the middle school. We can't really talk too much about it because it is part of our emergency management plan. And they actually did a movie in this building, and they use it as a drill procedure for all the schools in the county. Uh, preventative maintenance plans, we have long-term. We have uh, short term, we do a lot as far as the facilities. The third goal, and this is a goal that the ARA funds, which are the stimulus funds, we received approximately $1.5 million in stimulus money. This is to improve student support services, which is our special education program. And subsequently, we spend a lot of time, and this year, a major thrust is an inclusion in the elementary schools. And subsequently, we will talk a little bit more about that as the year progresses. But right now we're probably spending about, um, we received uh, 1.5, so we have about $750,000 that we're putting funneling into these programs. And we have a very successful program. We probably have about 12% of youngsters who are in special services, and we're doing a very nice job. And we track those through this goal. Parent, parent community involvement, we have parent, uh, 
PIC, which is the Parent Involvement Committee, we have PTOs, we have student activities, and that, I would say, Jim Brown always says that about 80% of our children are involved in student activities, whether they be interscholastic or whether they be academic. There's a lot of parent groups that are involved, we have a ton of booster clubs, we have a lot of involvement in parental involvement. Increased modes of electronic communication. Through our pandemic plan, we are probably one of the first schools that are trying to go web-based. If God forbid our buildings go down and we can't teach from these buildings, we have a plan now that's going to go out to the county that we can teach as long as the student has the internet. We'll, we're at the forefront of that through the county, as well as ParentLink. You get messages every so often. We try not to overuse that, but that is our fourth goal. Next, fiscal accountability. We have very clean audits year in and year out. We are fiscally responsible. We are probably, I believe it's Mr. McEnone, number four of 103 districts as far as per pupil expenditures. Everything is related to fiscal accountability, budgeting, and so on and so forth. The only thing that we're having trouble is, is creating an education foundation. That's been one thing that we just cannot get up and running, and it's an outside individual, and for whatever reason, we just can't get it going. But that's one of our goals, and we'll continue to work on that. Six, professional and staff development. A lot of acronyms. We're working very hard on what is called classroom walkthroughs. Constantly being in the classroom, learning about what instruction is, working with the teachers, working with the supervisors. PLC, professional learning communities. That is a mandate. We're a year ahead of it in this district. We're going to be doing a lot of professional learning communities, which is predominantly uh, when we all learn together. And it's a, it's a learning environment. We get together as groups. We pick a particular topic, whether it be instruction, and we move on. Administrators have it. Supervisors have it. Teachers have it. Paraprofessionals, everybody. Our professional Development Committee is one of the best. We constantly get our county plan approved year in and year out. And Monday is our big day. It's our staff development day where every teacher comes for five hours and we do a ton of staff development. And then you have professional improvement plans, professional development plans, professional growth plans. That's individual growth plans for every individual in this building, whether it's a PIP, a PDP, a PGP. All this goal, this goal by necessary curriculum, technology, staff, and service training is all related to those types of acronyms. I'm moving very quickly. Our mission statement. Basically, it's all over every building. School district educates today's learners to be tomorrow's leaders. That's what it's all about. We're educating our students to become tomorrow's leaders. Okay, I'm sure this is what most of you have come to. This is the survey that was sent out. First part of it is the parent survey. I'm going to quickly go through this and if anybody has any questions. Now you say to yourself, why am I doing this as part of the strategic plan? Because this is the assessment piece to determine whether or not we're meeting our goals. So we, one part of the, of the plan is, is that we have to go out and survey the community to find out, and the staff, to find out how we're doing. Sort of like an Ed Koch for the, our, our, uh, some of the older uh, or more experienced individuals in this room. Ed Koch was uh, somebody that I really admired. He was the mayor of New York City and he was real good at it. So first question, cleanliness. 80% of the people, uh, and these are the parent, uh, this is the parent group, 80% of the individuals that were surveyed said that we're doing a good job. All right? And I'll tell you why. A lot of the comments, remember, was due to the high school. This building was under construction for three years. And subsequently, there was a lot of complaints related to this building, which I don't blame. It was a tough building to keep clean. Next one. Uh, parental involvement, rate the opportunities of parental involvement. 83% of the people say we do a very good, a good job. Next one. Uh, your principal, how you rate them. 91% of the individuals, 56.7% say our principals are doing a great job. I think that says loads about what we're doing in this place. Uh, vice principals, I was a vice principal. I don't know if I would have got a very resounding a high mark because you're usually the hammer, but for the most part, 91% of the people that were surveyed said doing a good job, do a very good job, and 48% said we're doing a very good job. Um, 
uh, rate your experience in program services special education. That's a phenomenal 86%, it's phenomenal. Because there's so many different variables that go into a special education program. 50%, almost 50% say we're doing an outstanding to a very good job. 81% um, uh, say the guidance department's doing a nice job. Uh, and almost 40% say we're doing an outstanding job. Uh, transportation services, I can tell you why transportation services is bad. Anybody guess? Courtesy busing. So this, remember, this was done, a lot of people still writing in, I want my kid bus. Why did you take courtesy busing away? So a lot of times we get hit with that, which is understandable. And every so often certain people complain that the bus doesn't stop, unfortunately, right in front of their home. So it makes it a little bit difficult. But I think we do a very good job there. Next. Uh, the administrator, central office. I thought we should have been up. 85% uh, of us, uh, and people that were surveyed, said we were doing a good, to a very good job. Uh, the problem with a lot of people that said, they said you don't really know us, which I guess is a good thing. So there's a lot of people that didn't respond to us. Um, as far as uh, the experience, the overall experience, 85% say we're doing, they're very happy with the overall experience. The amount of parents that were surveyed were 1,000. So it's pretty much 33% of the population. It was done through internet-based survey monkey. There's no way we could really track it. So subsequently, it was very unbiased. And we put it out there so that uh, everybody had an opportunity. We gave them plenty of time. And that's a pretty good no for what was what came back. Next. All right, uh, the staff survey. Just quickly, I'll go through this. Again. 65% said they were happy with the cleanliness of the building. A lot of the complaints were from this building, which is understandable. And I think we're doing much better this year. Um, professional development, 80% are happy with the professional development. And you have this. This is uh, on the desk, so you could just follow along. I put it in, in the packet. Um, great. Your supervisor, 92%. 58.6% say they're doing a very good job. Principal of your building, wow, 98% of the staff say that the principal's doing a good job. Look at the very good, it's almost 85%, which is real, very, very good. Uh, vice principals, believe it or not, 95%, which is great. And they usually, uh, you know, sometimes you have to be the hammer when you're, when you're the vice principal, but a very high rating. And, uh, because most of them don't really know me, uh, it's a 90% rating. That's why they ranked me with calls, so that's how I got so high. So uh, for the most part, 9.6% was pretty good. I mean, I'm very happy about that. And you always get nervous, and I'm telling you, this is the truth. A lot of my superintendents said to me, you put this out when you ask people about how you're doing. Aren't you afraid that it's going to come back, that you're going to get hammered? I said, sure I am. But it is what it is, and I was happy to see that, uh, for the most part, people seem to be happy with the district. Also, um, of the staff, I believe it was, Marilyn, 450 staff members out of about, um, I guess, about 750. So it's close. And again, we gave them every opportunity. It was internet-based. So it wasn't like we were looking over their shoulder, you know, you know just... You know, Gambino wasn't running it. You know, this is, uh, you know, on the up and up, and we tried to get a real fair sample. Parental involvement, 85% think that we do a good job with that, of the staff. Special education, 86%, which is great. And 82% said a uh, reimbursement of expenditures. There's always sometimes that you know, people get a little frustrated with trying to re get reimbursed for something, uh, whether it be for professional development and so on and so forth. It's pretty good. This is really phenomenal. The next slide. Ninety-nine percent of the people are happy with payroll. That's unusual. I'll be honest with you. A lot of people get very frustrated with payroll, and for the most part, Chris and and Emilio and the people that's in Kathy and the people that are in the back, they just do a wonderful job. I, I can't say enough about them. And uh, support and practices uh, and retention practices, 81% uh, say we do a good job at that. And that concludes.
my uh, quick presentation. On the back also, um, if uh, you go to the last two or three pages, it summarizes those uh, different pie charts and it explains from last year to this year a little bit about how we did as opposed to the last time. We put this out two years ago. This strategic plan is what guides everything that we do in this district. We have a meeting tomorrow that we're going to go over a couple of the goals and we're going to do what is called the actual plan team reports. And we take it very seriously and this is our we're starting our fourth year of a five-year plan. And I want to thank everybody that's on the committee because it is a time-consuming committee and there's a lot of uh, follow-up information. So, uh, does anybody have any questions? Anything? Thank you, Mr. McEnroe. Any board comments or questions? Anybody from the public, open up the public if you have any questions or comments on what was just presented. Um, I will open up again for the public for the agenda items and again for any business that may be coming before the board. Thank you, Mr. McEnroe. No, thank you, Mr. McEnroe. Okay, we have nothing on the correspondence. Everybody should receive a copy of the minutes from the uh, regular meeting of September 15th. Anybody have any comments or questions in addition to the leases for the minutes? If not, I'll take a motion to accept and file the minutes. So moved. I need a second. Second. Any roll call vote? Mrs. Banco? Yes. Mr. Bishawa? Yes. Mrs. Esposito? Yes. Mr. Lembo? Yes. Mrs. Strapp? Yes. And Mr. McEnroe? Yes. Uh, student council representatives not present this evening. Uh, parental uh, involvement representatives report. I, I noticed. I was not able to go to the meeting yesterday. So okay. I really can't report. Okay. Nothing, nothing heard. Um, on the attorney's report, we have none. District highlights, Mr. Vice President. Yes. Congratulations to the Project Before team and Mrs. Judy Strano, social worker for Project Before, for being named the Library Partner of the Year by the Libraries of Middlesex County. Susan Kaplan, the director of the Cerebral Public Library, nominated Project Before and Judy Strano for this award because, of, because their partnership has enabled the Cerebral Public Library to improve services to the families of children with special needs. They have been honored at a reception on September 29th of 09. Last fall, Mrs. Strano approached the Cerebral Library staff with feedback from these families, which instituted a parent meeting. The information that the library staff gained was then incorporated into professional development training for the library staff. Parent resources and easy readers were added to the library collections. The library director and youth services librarian then visited Project Before and learned more about working with our children. Several weeks later, the Project Before classes had an exciting trip to the library. With Mrs. Strano's help, the library has gained an awareness of the many ways to better serve and promote library resources and programs to children with disabilities and their families. Thank you, Mrs. Strano and the Project Before staff for all you do for the children in our district. Congratulations to our district technology integration teacher, Mrs. Barbara DeSantis, for having a voice thread on Ellis Island that she created, accepted by the National Voice Thread site as a part of their digital library. The students from Mrs. Carrie O'Neill Fleischner's fifth grade class, along with Mrs. O'Neill Fleischner, all contributed to the project. Kudos on this magnificent achievement. High school art teacher Carolyn Corbino was selected to the State Department of Education to create the brochure for the Department's Office of Leadership Development. Dr. Thomas Gambino, the Central New Jersey Regional Coordinator, commented on the superb work done by Ms. Corbino and expressed his gratitude for her work and professionalism. Just another example of the excellent work by one of our many fine teachers. Congratulations to the Wilson, Wilson School teachers for being chosen by Sam's Club as an excellent teaching staff. To honor this achievement, 10 staff members were awarded $100 gift certificates to be used for their children in classrooms. The recipients who were randomly selected were Janet Mahoney, Karen Bryan, Amy Stuber, Barbara Perillo, Jessica Vigiano, Steve Fisher, Stephanie Ginsberg, Kerry Lawson, Diane Worless, and Jennifer Coyne. For those teachers who did not receive a gift certificate, bouquets of flowers were given to each as a thank you. A beautiful cake and balloon completed the celebration. The Wilson staff is very proud to be the recipient of this honor. Congratulations also to the Cerebral War Memorial High School Red Cross Club and advisors Mrs. Denise Brown and Mrs. Virginia Kenai school nurse at the high school, for being selected as the 2009 recipient 
of the American Red Cross Outstanding Youth Involvement Award for Central Jersey. This award is presented to schools, individual youth, youth groups, and adult youth leaders who have, through the development and, di and direction of specific activities, improved services delivery in the schools and or community. Thank you for making us proud. That concludes our highlights, Mr. President. Mrs. Bowman, who is the principal of Wilson School. Um, congratulations, I think that's quite an honor to uh, uh, school to be recognized as an excellent teaching staff. I guess um, excellent principals just mentor and nurture excellent teaching staff, so congratulations. Thank you very much, I'll tell you, I will be like that. They were, they were very, very pleased and very surprised. We, I wouldn't, we did not know who was going to get the award when we said that. It was going to be a surprise morning and they had to be there. And we didn't know <coughs> They were all very surprised, and we received very nice um, comments from Sam's Club as to the fact that they were chosen as an overall excellence uh, staff. I'm, I'm very proud of them. That's indicative of leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Superintendent, if you can take us to your report, sir. Yes, sir. First, uh, Section 1, Buildings and Grounds, there's no report for this um, meeting. Section 2, Finance. Um, a is uh, the, the list of bills. Um, there's uh, petty cash, and there's a uh, education program um, of two non-classified students. There's a ton of disposal of equipment on pages two and three. Uh, there's some not there's a non-classified student uh, placement. Uh, there's also an installation of a playground at Samsung Upper Elementary School, a tuition contract for South River, a uh, contract for one of the teachers in our district. Uh, tuition contract and a roof replacement um, SDA grant seeking grant for land associates um, on page four uh, it continues uh, as well as uh, there are a bunch of change orders starting with uh, section I believe it is oh no I'm sorry section N and there's uh, that goes down to MNOPQR. There's approximately $106,000 of chain order, change orders there to the new uh, construction at the high school. And if you look at the addendum, ST, UV, and W are another approximately $130,000 worth of change orders uh, of uh, stuff that's being done at the high school. Um, any questions? With section two, I, I do. Mrs. Duff, do you know how many, about how many, approximately how many students we have from neighboring districts paying tuition for our uh, programs? Uh, no, there are. How many districts or how many students? How many students total uh, coming in from out of district? So I know this is over the last couple of agendas we had a couple of students. Uh, I think we have three. Three that are coming in, and that's for at Samsel exclusively. At Samsel exclusively. At this point, yeah. Actually, yes, they are. We have out-of-district students, too, that do. We have a number of out-of-district students, too, that um, uh, come to us from another town because these students are placed in treatment homes in Cerebo. Uh, they attend school through Cerebo Public Schools, and we collect tuition from all of those students as well. And there are, I think, currently, Mr. DeAndre, uh, did we bill for about five? Five students between filling back the State Department and the home Probably district. Right. And, and how much was that in savings, Ms. Sullivan, that you uh, got back? Three hundred and thirty-nine, three, three, yeah, three hundred thirty-nine thousand for the um, 08 09 school year, and that's a recurring tuition. Really as long as those students stay here in Sayreville and are housed in Sayreville, we will continue to collect whatever the tuition is for their. Um, stay in our school in an out of district placement, and that includes tuition and child study teams. I know the state has always lagged behind in these types of payments, but they're paying 100% for these placements? Yes, they are. And that's due to uh, Ms. Sullivan's due diligence because let me tell you, a lot of these students would be slipping through the cracks <laughs> and we wouldn't be getting tuition for them. So I want to thank Ms. Sullivan for working hard on that because I know they, they come in. Well, it was a concern of what had in the past because uh, that was the question we had. We've cleaned up a lot of that. And, uh, okay, moving on to section four. Mrs. Backer. Um, two questions. F, this, um, if there's a Middlesex Academy now for middle school students, and, and how do you get to go there? The, yes, those are uh, general education students. 
Yeah, non that, that's under you? Um, no, no, that's, that's a placement of a, no, that's, that's a regular placement. placement. That's, a, that's a general ed placement. That right. the youngster was not able to um, perform in this environment. Oh, so and it's, it's a middle school level? Correct. Student? Where is that? Do you know? The, uh, I think it's in the that's a good question because I asked the same question. Is this the first person we've done this? Um, we've done this before in that school? No, we've done it before. We've done it many times. They change the name of, of oh, it sometimes okay. too. Yeah. So it wasn't always called. I know, Miss Miss Jakubic. I, I see you no, moving. Just, but that <laughs> I wasn't sure if you wanted to say something, but it is. We discussed this. And this youngster's having. Um, we moved this individual um, from our uh, program. We have like a pace program. Um, that we have at the middle school, and some of those, some of the youngsters cannot um, survive in that program. Okay, another question, G. Um, how does um, this come about, and how do these funds get determined um, to use this on what playground, what school? Okay, I, I can take. That uh, she jumped back. right on that. I'm sorry. We discussed this as well. Okay. Um, well, the way the IDEA grant goes is. There's a component for preschool, like a set aside fixed amount for preschool, and then for um, uh, six through 21. So this particular, um, the playground equipment was for the preschool. And the way that's determined is through um, collaboration with um, people in the district, what are our needs? And um, it was determined with the therapist that um, a playground situation would be a way to transfer the school the skills for physical therapy, occupational therapy, into something that's developmentally appropriate for kids. And um, and so we are hopefully going to have this up and running in a, a month or two. I remember when we moved the students there, there was a lot of discussion about the playground. Is this the playground that we had needed? Is this the one back when we talked about Do the I think so? Time? Yes, okay. I do. Um, it's a pretty expansive piece of equipment, I mean, they needed about uh, 30 by 35 for it. And in consultation with the physical therapist, it really incorporates a lot of the movements that the kids will need. So, so this is only for the preschool, not for the upper elementary students? No, this is preschool. It's preschool only. Yeah. So it's yeah, and so we can only use the preschool funds for preschool equipment. So it's going to be in a section where only the preschool students access? Yes, within that enclosed program. Thank you. Moving on to section three, we have a retirement, James Galavides, um, a few transfers, um, some paraprofessional uh, corrections because they're still we're still uh, placing them and until we, you know, hopefully this will be the end of them. There's a few more transfers down at the bottom. Um, the cooperative education student, uh, I believe, from uh, to the business office is also starting on October seventh. Uh, we have some professional days on letter H. There's a few more on the addendum of substitutes, which is uh, addendum I and J. There are a uh, retroactively paraprofessional, additional paraprofessional transfers uh, effective uh, back on September 10th. Any questions with uh, section three? With none, moving to personnel. Uh, Reemployment of Stephanie Woods. I have to apologize, Stephanie. We just missed her. Of uh, 790 employees, uh, uh, poor Stephanie almost didn't get a paycheck. So that was, uh, you know, that was our mistake. So hopefully, you, I'll blame that on Mr. DeAndrea. Um, B. Uh, there's a leave of absence, uh, unpaid personal leave. Um, and there's a retirement, and I would just like to say. Um, I wish the Morasco family the best, and uh, it's a very unfortunate situation. She never really got a chance to um, enjoy her retirement. Hopefully she's enjoying wherever she is now. Um, F is an addition um, as far as the uh, a, a, a move up in uh, status. Uh, we'll just put the movie to a BA to a BA 30, and there are some other salary adjustments in the same manner on section F. Uh, if you look at section G, there's another addition on the addendum. These are professional days, and that goes on to page um, 10, I believe. 
And there's a few additions on H, which are the substitutes. Um, and there's a few more on that. So that is section four. Any questions with section four? But not moving to policy. Uh, we have one change. Um, I believe uh, this is a, a PIC bylaw, and it's only a very small change in the PIC bylaw. And basically, what it's going to say is um, that they can be elected to sit on this council by a majority of the elected PIC members present when selecting a PIC representative to the Board of Education. So it's just that small what, 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 what did it change from? It, it, it used to be just a call when you just mention that, but it just was people internally. It used to be, the old language would say you had to be elected to a PTO position or to the high school principal's advisory committee. Um, the individuals who hold these offices have a number of meetings to go to each month, including those at their school, and PTO meetings at the other schools because they're a very collaborative group and help one another. Sometimes it's difficult for them to come to PIC, and yet they want to be able to be at PIC, um, and yet can't come to a board meeting because that would be one more meeting that they would have to attend. So the suggestion came from PIC that we allow non-elected members, people who aren't PTO people, but who are loyal, pick attendees to represent the group. So we have our elected officials only choosing such an individual should one of the elected individuals not be able to be a board rep. Mrs. Macko, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I understand the, the concept. I guess I just have trouble with, I'm not sure, it says the elected by majority of the elected pick members. Why is it an elected pick member and not just all the pick members? because the original provision was written so that only the, represent, the representative could only be an elected member, someone who's representing the parents right, of that is school. No such, what is, there is no such thing as an elected PIC member. Anybody can be a PIC member. An elected No, uh, PTO, PTO member. That's what it was. It used to be, you had to be a PTO member in order to come. A PTO to come walker. here, but not to be in the PIC. So you want so to say? Think, why does it say elected PTO? So you want to say elected PTO members? No, just, no, I just want to take the word elected out. Right? Just because there's no such thing as an elected PTO. But then the individual might not be chosen from those who were elected in each school to reflect the interests of those schools. It was to ensure that it, PTO people are electing the individual that will represent them at this board meeting should they not be able to attend. The purpose of PIC was to represent the schools. Right, but when it, I say, what is an elected PIC member? An Define elected, that pick, word. An elected, elected PIC, PIC member is a PIC member of a PTO who's an officer in a PTO or the principal's advisory committee. And they were all elected by the parents of their building into their PTO, but not into PIC. Correct. So why does it have to be, why can't it just be, you just be elected by the PIC? Why does it have to be an elected? Why, in other words, because, why do you have to be an elected officer to elect the person being here? Why can't the PIC committee just pick on their own? Because PIC is supposed to be representative <laughs> of the parents of the schools. And we felt that the elected members of the parents of the schools should be the individuals who choose the individual that sits on this board. I think the concern is, let me take it the opposite way. Okay, I walk in, I have nothing to do with the parent organizations, and I happen to walk into, a, into the PIC meeting. What could happen if you don't have that word elected there, I can immediately become sitting up here if there's like, say, six or seven people at the PIC, and you had no affiliation with any, with any of the PTOs. I think it's hard to write it, but I think the spirit and intent of what was trying to say there is that there has to be an elected PTO person in order for them to sit on this body. And if you, if, if, if the majority of the people on this board say it doesn't matter, then, you know, it's okay with us too. Well, I guess well, what I'm no, saying is you're sort of... Well, it is well, it you have okay. to change the policy. It isn't okay, and I'm going to tell you why. Because then it would be possible for individuals from, say, a single school 
to all, all of a sudden come to a pick meeting and come in a great number. Right. And that's the evening we're going to pick the board representative. So now we have a lot of individuals who aren't elected representatives of their schools coming to a pick meeting. We're choosing the pick representative to the board, and none of the individuals have been elected members representing their schools. Right, and I understand that if you have such a large group, but usually it's not that. Usually it's a small group. So suppose only five people are there and only one person is an elected PTO member, they get to pick who comes. That's, I'm looking at from the opposite direction when there's only a small group. So then that would fall on one person to pick the, the whole out of the body. Well, the person, number one, would have to uh, agree to sit and it only happens when we don't have a PTO person who's able to. And I, I really have to thank the PTO members who attend PIC because quite frankly, they've covered the board meetings for the past two years. And it's not all of them, it's a few of them. Um, we are going to issue notices or send letters to the, the PTO organizations in each school to ask that they ensure that there be one representative from their school at every meeting and then I think we would have a representative member of PIC as well as the school sitting on the board should the need arise. So technically this is not really necessary an elected PIC member, it's an elected PTO member that's yeah. voting on the PIC. It's not an elected PIC member. It's, it's an elected, elected PTO, PTO member. member. That's what it is. That's that's well, it is. yes, but an, an elected PIC member is, it, is a PTO member. Right. I, I guess it, because the way it looks, it makes people think that you need to be elected to pick, by the way I read that's that. Fine. That's fine. Right. I can, how about if I change it by a majority of the elected PTO right. slash parent advisory, because it has yeah, to be yeah, just so I can change like that. You have to be elected to be part of it. That's fine. This is complicated. Well, we're trying to be representative, but right. we're also trying to be I, kind. I, well, I, no, I, because I remember back when Pick first started. I don't started, care. I vote yes. The, the letters that they got out, there was this concept that you had to be a PTO officer right. to be a member. Any other questions in section five? I don't want to get caught up with the Pick members. The changes will be made for the second right. reading. I'm not even going to look up. Second first. reading will be. I, I know Ms. June is looking at me right now. So All right. Right. Section six. Um, I just would like Ms. Bauman to just talk a little bit about all the different curricula that are there. Social studies, kindergarten, grade one, grade two, uh, study skills six, U.S. history two, honors, and woods one. Where they're coming in like like wildfire now. So. And, and there are many, many more on my desk that I have, you know, we're tweaking. So be prepared. We can, we can get them on email. Yeah. Yes. About this deep on my desk. And I and I, I say my mistake is drinking one out. They're very lengthy. I'll try not to. Uh, the first three um, we're very happy with because I, they really address one of the things that we're concerned about with USAC, uh, interdisciplinary and cross-curricular. And these were written to include, so that we're using uh, language arts materials as well as the internet and other kinds of social studies materials rather than simply a textbook. And we feel it represents what the children should be experiencing and what the real world is all about. And then we had, a, we had the study skills program at the sixth grade, and it's a very comprehensive uh, curriculum. And I think it addresses the, the needs of what we think students at that level need to be able to learn as far as when they go forward in, in their careers in school. Um, the U.S. History Honors is, is the one that um, Mr. Gentile is here with us. That's a, a, an addition that we put in uh, because we had AP and we had the CP, we now have honors. And we think that's a very good addition. And the wood one, um, you'll be shortly getting, I believe, wood two, uh, is updating that entire program as to the kinds of things that we think the wood program, instead of the old so-called wood shop a few years ago, should be current with what's out there today for that. And as I said, you have many, many more coming. I want to thank Ms. Baum, and I know she reads every word of them. So it is very comprehensive, and, and uh, also the uh, the cross-content stuff that we're doing as well. So there's a lot of stuff coming up. So I appreciate you and the supervisors and everybody else and the teachers who are involved. Uh, B is uh, special services placements and different services that are provided uh, for our youngsters. Uh, any questions with section six? I have a curriculum question. With the um, history honors and I know science student, is there any plan forward to move to the math department? Well, Mr. Everhart is here with us tonight. If you would, can you hear this uh, question, Mr. Everhart? No, I didn't. About ma and having a math honors program. 
uh, it's a little different with your in your area because you have the scaffolding of the courses and they move and you want to talk about how those courses are scaffolded so that we can understand the difference between let's say a, a history honors and a, and a language arts or, or social studies why don't you come what up what we do is we start separating our students Cut the mic. Yeah. Use the mic. Use the mic. We place students on our upper level of mathematics starting with this, the, uh, at the end of the sixth grade. They get an in-house test and that is also uh, put together with uh, state standardized tests, is put together with the uh, teacher's recommendation and uh, with this information in mind, we then form our 7-1 our group, which is our top group in mathematics. Those students uh, as a rule, move on to 8-1, which is our, our algebra group in the 8th grade. Okay. Students in the 7-2 group that perform exceptionally well can be recommended for the 8-1 group as well by their classroom teacher. Once that has been set, there are other opportunities for students to reach the top layer. In the 9th grade, the 8-1 group that took algebra takes geometry. They're kept together as, 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 as a whole they take geometry, they take algebra 2 as 10th graders, they take as 11th graders pre-calculus and AP calculus as seniors. Now those students that show a, a late talent in mathematics have an additional opportunity to reach the top group. Any student that gets a B or better as a 9th grader in algebra may elect to double up and take both algebra 2 and geometry as a 10th grade student. By doing so, they will then join the top track and take pre-calculus as an 11th grader and AP calculus as a senior. So there's actually three opportunities for every student that reaches from the 6th grade to the 12th grade for which a student can reach our top group uh, of the uh, AP calculus class as a senior. The question that I want to know, we have, like for example, is U.S. History Honors, which is an honors weighted class. We don't have the name honors associated with it. It's a layering, certainly, by when students at which grade level they take a certain course. Uh, uh, as far as weighting their average, the honors weight is applied for AP calculus, calculus, that sort of thing. Uh, but as far as having the title honors for geometry, honors as opposed to geometry, no, we don't have that. Uh, it, is, it is known more as our top group that takes geometry as ninth graders is our top math group. But is there any plan to create any honors level yes, math Yes, we have been courses? talking about that. That's something that I spoke to Mrs. Ballard about that I spoke to this day. See, I, I guess we're looking at, and I understand what you're saying, but if I, if I take your, your top students that you put on, like my daughter did the algebra two and it doubled up the geometry, um, if it's not an honors called class, when I look at that transcript, I'm not going to see honors algebra on there. So no, you're you're right, honors you're right, there's not going to be an honors class, but they're actually doing honors work. Is what they're taking a year sooner than they're the right. So sooner. that was called that on. Would you agree? You could say so. Yes. Okay. So what would be what would be the mechanism? I think well, the next curriculum meeting. The one thing, thing we, would, we would certainly have to do is it's not just right now it's the pacing and when they take the class to right. turn as a top group. If we were to designate an honors course, we'd have to separate the curriculum in some fashion uh, by which they would do an extra a section, uh, a achievement level of mathematics within geometry or within algebra. But if, even if you went outside the realm of geometry and algebra, I guess my question goes back to something a little broader scale. For example, we have honors probability and matrix algebra, which we had when I was in the school. Is there any thought to bring in any sort of other class, like say a statistics course, a statistics course, and honors linear equations? I mean, anything that could give it an honors level to students that are interested in pursuing math. We do have a probability statistics course. Right. We don't call it an honors course per se, but we do have a probability and statistics course. Right, if, so if my we are, question is, is there any plan to create The plan that we are looking to right now, and it's in discussion stages, to put the, that honors title <coughs> to the geometry, algebra 2, pre-calculus classes. Thank you, Rich. Moving uh, to, we're on section 7. Co-curriculum um, is a volunteer Red Cross club. Some 
Um, I'm going to withdraw item C. Let somebody can tell me what school that is in because I transportation policy as usual, different types of contracts, and a number of trips uh, in the amount of 12. And there is an emergency evacuation drills which we had in the month of September that we highlighted for New Jersey CUSAC. And there's also a transportation of the bus to New Brunswick. Uh, that concludes my report. Any questions, comments from the board before we come to the phone? I have a question. Suppose for some reason we uh, are able to fill more than one bus and we have an overwhelming response. Is there a mechanism to change this? Um, I, I, I think uh, I think we would know, need to know as soon yeah. as possible. Okay, but like, how, like, what's the time frame? Like, 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 like now. Like right. <laughs> yeah. Pat, though, I, I think, think, think public knowledge. I think what we should do is notify our public that next Thursday night we're trying to get a bus trip to go to the Middlesex County Freeholders meeting. Is that what you're referring yeah. to? What we're trying to do as a board, we've decided to try to move the polling places from our schools for our children's safety. And what we've done is we've had petitions at back to school night, and we're organizing buses, a bus or bus trip to the Middlesex County Freeholder meeting next Thursday night to have our input put before the freeholders to get some kind of like dissuade them to move the polling places out of our school district. Am I correct on that, Mr. Backdow? And if you would like to attend this meeting, with us, uh, we have Mrs. Backo has an email address. You can notify her and uh, make arrangements where we're going to have the bus to pick up us as a group to take us to New Brunswick. Where there'll be parking for the bus. We'll all get on a bus or buses, whatever it may be. Attend the meeting. We have five minutes a month, if I'm correct, Mrs. Backo's individuals to speak to the board or members of the freeholders to voice our opinion of displeasure of having the polling places in our schools. I guess the original question about the second bus would be, um, as soon as we know, um, is it possible, would it make sense that we would request two buses, you'd always cancel one without, uh, I think it's easy to cancel than to add one last minute. Um, you would be paying for a bus rider to be on call. Yeah, if you do that, you got to pay for it. If you wish for us to do that, just let us know. We'll well, what, 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 is you, what is you absolutely have to know drop date by? I'd love to say the day before. Uh, okay, no, yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah. But if, uh, that's fine. If the emergency exists that you need it, just uh, reach out and we can sure it retroactively. We've done things. And I'm sure Mrs. Shevlock can find somebody that will drive a bus. Yeah. She can drive. I know Barry's not. I know Barry. We appreciate her. Mom. Barry Anderson isn't available next year. It's available next Thursday. So <laughs> we're going to talk more about that on the discussion. <laughs> okay. Any other questions before we open up to the public? If not, at this time, welcome to the public for agenda items only. If you have any questions or comments on agenda items, please come on up. Please uh, state your name and uh, address for the record. If you don't want to be videotaped, please let this young man know. That's our pick representative. Are you elected or not? I have a question. Inquiring why I have to come up. Uh, just to clear it up, uh, the way it works at PEG, it tends to be the same core group of us there every time. Unfortunately, the PTO officers that are there, there are more officers there than just myself, but the ones that are there generally can't come tonight because they have other commitments. Mrs. DePinto, my partner in crime, always is teaching CCD tonight. So while she would be a valid pick rep, she generally can't do it. Um, there were other officers there that just can't make it then tonight. I sometimes can't make it both nights. So this would just clarify that when we're all there, we can pick somebody else who is a faith. They come to the pick meetings all the time. We could pick somebody else who's there, just does not happen to hold an office in the PTO. That's all that that is clarifying. So you would have a pick rep tonight instead of myself who couldn't make it. I'm voting yes. OK. Now, my question wasn't on the theory. It was on the word elected pick member. I just I, I, I think and that was, when we talked member. about it, that was why. Because if, looking at it from the other end, if you suddenly did have a large car, if there was a big issue that arose and there was a large crowd of people there and say there were only two PTO officers but suddenly there was a large crowd who elected a PIC representative then that perhaps we wouldn't have thought would fairly represent PIC, it could be a problem by keeping it an elected PIC 
officer. And we do, I mean, I do say at our PTO meetings that PIC is open to everybody. Yeah. Um, I do think a lot of people just don't go because of timing issues and because they know if something comes up at PIC, I'm going to report it at our next PTO meeting. So they don't bother. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying. Anyone else in the book? Mrs. Kilton? Mrs. Bloom, you're, you're next on our own. Barbara Kilton. Kudos and congratulations on the beautiful cafeteria and getting it done on time. I never thought it would happen, and I think it's part of a miracle that it was. After seeing it a couple months prior to school opening, I was really shocked to see that it was done on time. And it really is beautiful. Also, I mean, many times I complained at Lions Club breakfast years ago to Mr. DiPaolo. And I used to look at the broken shades, the chairs and tables that were dilapidated. It was embarrassing. It really was. I mean, your tax dollars in the community, and that was just the cafeteria. But this was long overdue in the cafeteria. And I must comment and compliment. Also, I know it's not on the agenda, but I don't want to get up again. Uh, a Mrs. <laughs> Brennan, <laughs> a Mrs. Brennan wrote a letter, and I think it was really positive, and it was quite a compliment. It was in the Home News Tribune about the children. I don't know if every board member read it, and you have it. I, I thought that was great. Pardon me. Oh, you're, you're, do you have it? No, no, okay. no, I don't have it. But on another note, uh oh, <laughs> the change orders. I mean, when I look and count up just today, I've missed quite a few meetings due to family, you know, commitments with my family, and I'm sorry, but when I look at the change orders and totally miss up, I mean, it's over a quarter of a million dollars. You had a $2 million referendum passed. And is it the architect on the bidding? What causes all these errors to amount to just this meeting a quarter of a million dollars. And one I just read, and just off the top of my head, $46,000 for a new main store drainage. Now, you wouldn't notice as an architect and planning and with a builder, and then all these are additions and additions and additions. Now, whose fault is it? Is it the contractor's fault? Is it the architect's fault, not foreseeing this? But I think it's sad that you could take a quarter of a million dollars to me for errors. Uh, I'll have Mr. Gendry uh, comment on some of those, but let me say not all change orders are errors of omission. Some change orders, um, I don't want to say were forced, but were recommended by our building construction office um, to do because they prefer it that way. Those result in some, but they were, those were minimal. Um, so yes, yeah, some of the change orders, as you know, and as we've been talking about over the last couple of years, have been a direct result a direct result of uh, omissions and design flaws on behalf of some of our contractor professionals. There's no doubt about that. But specifically, Ms. Nian, do you want to address the drainage one um, that we were talking about earlier? Uh, the drainage one, what it, uh, occurred is uh, when they were actually laying out the new main entrance, uh, I believe it was only a discrepancy of about eight, eight to 10 inches where they found that when forming the foundation for the new steps, that it uh, repeated upon a, a current storm drain, so they had to reroute it. So, I mean, some could argue it was an unforeseen item because until you dig up the footings or the ground, you don't know exactly where the storm drains are. You only have sketches that you work off of. So, and some could say it's unforeseen. Others would call it a design issue. So, it, it's a matter of who's looking at it at what point in time that you determine it. But uh, the difference was only about eight to ten inch difference once they opened up the ground. So they had a route to the storm drain in a different direction. Well, they knew it was there, but apparently once they dug it up, they found out it was a little bit more to the right than to the left. But it just saddens me to take a quarter of a million dollars when we have schools that need renovations. I mean, you had Wilson School floor. You have uh, the roof, I believe, in Arlet. You have so many things to keep up and that quarter of a million dollars could have been used elsewhere. And that just upsets well, this me. Is unfortunately, orders unfortunately you wouldn't have been able to do those things with these monies. This money is only for this high school project. 
at this point in time. How are we financially with the referendum? Are we still in sync? Uh, about a million dollars. We, we have a million dollars left over from the 2.2 million that we referendum uh, last December. Yes. Um, we're, we're that was originally left over from Samsung that you used with the referendum. Well, the way they bonded, yes, yeah. yes. But we are, and I appreciate your comments uh, about the cafeteria. This is just half of it, the other half is on the other side of the wall. Um, uh, you're absolutely right. I know you've been a critic uh, of some of this construction, and I think on about 99% of those things I agree with you on. Um, you're frustrated. Um, you're disappointed. Um, I, I can't begin to describe my feelings and that of Mr. Rashad and Mr. Sayak and Mr. Lembo, who sit on and um, really uh, have gotten, and you said miracle, and I, I, I like to say uh, well managed because we've really been on top of this from a board perspective by going to these weekly meetings up until last month. Um, you know, there are certain posts that you can't see now that we became very familiar with from a technical perspective, understanding what the problems were that drove these change orders. But we're at the point now where, um, you know, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're almost done with this project. Uh, I think when all said and done, in all honesty, that we look at the dollar figure that this cost us versus what we originally had thought we're going to be well within the scope of typical construction projects of this magnitude, size, and duration uh, in New Jersey. Um, and I don't know if that's something to be proud of, but it's certainly something that I have to gauge that on when I look at how well we're doing here with this project. The only thing was, when I watched the construction, it's a John Ray, correct me if I'm wrong. They're the the main general contractor, right? The same contractor for the Cheesequake Road yes, County right. School. Yes. And watch the progress. All right, it was brand new. This was additions. Right? Yep. But I was critical because driving by, it was a disaster. I mean, the whole construction project was sloppy. And the way it was done, and being, having people in the business my family was demolition and construction and whatnot. And being associated with projects before, I was appalled on the, you know, the way it was carried out. Are you talking about the Cheese Creek School? Our school, when the additions were going on, right. and I couldn't even imagine graduation. I mean, it was just a sloppy, sloppy, and even unsafe construction site. When they weren't fencing it in, where they were leaving garbage, the way, that's why I'm really surprised it turned out as well and on time. So kudos for the board and the administration. And I sincerely mean that. And like I said, I'm not just a critic, just to criticize. The school system is important. Look what happened to Edison. I like Sal Mistretta. I know him. I really feel bad for him. But when you have to make a statement that you could go to the other high school because your test scores weren't up to par, that's sad. That really is. So, I mean, you stay on top of things, our test scores are there. I mean, you're keeping my property value. That's what I'm concerned about today. That, that's my number one goal. <laughs> Ms. Cookhouse, while I have you at the microphone, I know you weren't coming up again. Uh, uh, I hope you plan on coming the 15th. Yes, and I do. And I, I would love to give you as much microphone time as you would like <laughs> um, at the county well, board. Sure now, when you stand behind Mr. you. Mr. Julian, I'm going to bring you back, back. back. <laughs> but I will. Yes, I intend on well, coming. Welcome back, and I hope everyone enjoys you. your family. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Uh, Mrs. Bloom. You got your checkbook there? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Not for you. <laughs> now, I just wanted to ask, uh, on behalf of the executive board, what time your bus is leaving for the free holders meeting? I'm going to direct that question to the... That evening is when we uh, recognize our new teachers and our tenured teachers at our annual social. So if you're leaving after we're done, we would, some of the executive board members would like to join you, because I did come with you the last time. Oh, and it was we, I'd like to leave at 6, since the meeting six. starts at 7. I'm pretty sure we can make this bus leaving from here? Yes. From the parking lot here at 6. We will do our best to. The more people, the better, and the better representation we have of groups is better. Okay. Actually, if you could give me, if you have any sort of close range to visit, I will that would be great. get an email to you plan. tomorrow. I'll poll my board and I'll let you know who's coming. We love 100 people. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have to be just the board. Okay. If you, you can reach out, we, we, we went speaking. There were a lot of teachers, like from the elementary schools, that went like back to school, like that, mm -hmm. expressed interest too. So if you could like even send out an email. Yes, yeah, I will do that. I'll send out a general email to them. Plus, hopefully, we'll have a bunch of members from the SA that will be coming um, uh, to the barbecue on, on Friday. That might be a collective. Uh, we, we board can talk to them too and ask them for their support. Yeah. And then we'll feed them. Okay, sounds <laughs> good. As long as you feed them, they'll come. Thank you.
Thank you. Anyone else from the public? If not, I'll close it on the agenda. Um, right now, uh, I'll accept a motion to file and accept the superintendent's agenda. So, so moved. I need a second. Second. Okay. Mr. Rashada, motion. Mr. Nungo, second. Mrs. Mrs. Backer? Yes. Mr. Bishop? Yes. Mrs. Esposito? Yes. Mr. Lumbo? Yes. Mr. Strack? Yes. And Mr. McEnough? Yes, and I want to make sure that includes the pick of wording. <laughs> <laughs> when you figure it out, let me know. Okay. Um, on the background information, I just want to, um, the, October 23rd, there's a lot going on that day. We have the, um, the Eisenhower 40th anniversary. Um, we have the, um, I guess, the ribbon cutting um, ceremony for the uh, uh, Center of Lifelong Learning is that day as well. But I think the most important thing that day is Legislative Day. And uh, Mr. Gentile has been honoring that um, since he's been here. Uh, Mr. Bashar, uh, myself, and I know Mr. Syed from the board has have attended that every year. And I just want to mention it to the board again. Uh, if you're interested, I highly encourage you to do that if you can get off during the day. Um, what time is that? Is it 8.30, Mr. Gentile? We'll be here at 8.30. And then we go to class that following the next period. And, and I think it's a great opportunity to talk to the students. Uh, they're very inquisitive about the legislative process, about what it is being a board member. And I always open up the last 10 minutes for any questions, gripes, or complaints. And I think that's the most valuable part of, of talking to the students. I think now, out of all the times we went, this might be the most favorable time to go because they, they're benefiting from the schools. So I just want to encourage, I know last year I was a little disappointed. Um, and I will be going to the, uh, the next council meeting and, and, and asking them in public to uh, to get a hold of you uh, to come as well. I know in the past the mayor, the councilman, the assemblyman has come, and I think it's a great program, especially for the kids to meet us and, and talk to us. So, um, Mr. Clark is not here for the delegate of New Jersey school boards, but under discussion, there's a couple of things. And uh, Mr. Dian, do you want to handle the first one, the online cafeteria payment? Uh, yes, sir. We have an opportunity to provide online payments, of, and I'd like to start it at the high school. The only concern is, is there's, a, there's a transaction fee. Uh, and I, I guess I need direction from the board. Can you explain what that system is, what that entails? Uh, what it would be is, is that parents can go online through uh, several different services to pay for a child's cafeteria meals. So they can actually go online, put a payment in, say $100, and every time that the child uses, their cap uses the cafeteria, it gets deducted from that balance. Uh, and it's an online service, just like a... Who pays the fee? Well, that's the concern. Uh, as to how the board wishes to handle it if we move in this direction. The board can pay or the transaction fee can be passed on to the parents. Once, the, scale. once a system like this is implemented, can students still pay out of pocket? Absolutely. Day -day? This, is, this is just another option for those parents that wish to prepay uh, a child's uh, meal. And, and would they have a card and go swipe? Is that yes. Right? So it's like easy pass for lunch. Uh, yeah. How much is the fee? It's a sliding scale, depending on if they use an American Express, Discover, Visa, there's different charges. What's the average, or what, what do you think? Would be the I believe the percentages there? went from 0.1% up to 0.2.5% per transaction, plus $2.50 per transaction. So it depends on what you use and which one. So it's not a straightforward, <laughs> it, 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 it's not a straightforward thing. And the, you know, the question is, if we move in this direction, uh, I mean, it could be very expensive to the board. Who does this benefit other than the company that runs this? I mean, is this something our cafeteria workers has asked for, or is it some parents have asked for? Uh, my understanding from um, Mrs. Uh, Jenkins, this is more of a conversation that's been going on. Uh, she sees it as just another opportunity to get kids moving through and things of that nature. And, uh, I think if the parents are going to join on, they should, they should pay the cost of it. Just as if they're using their own credit cards or anything like that. Parents want the convenience, let them bear the It's a convenience for the parents so that they don't have to worry about having to give their kids money on a daily basis. Mr. DeAndre, who manages it? It's an online service. Who manages the money? Who manages the money? The online service collects the money and deposits it into our account. Who collects the, company. the bid? The company. No. Merchant. Merchant. When, when the I put the transaction in. I got a I got a ten dollar transaction fee. You call, you basically have to track that money because it has to go to that. And we have to pay for it. We the company merchant bar sends you a transaction analysis. And then we would have to pay. Right. So well, you could, the, if we're, you the board's pay, paying, 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 if parents are paying, they get charged. That's a double bill. Yeah. I'd rather talk about the uh, picture. <laughs> 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 
a uh, board member, I would recommend that we pass on this. Right, I agree. I think the parents would love it, but they're not going to pay that kind of thing. I, oh. I don't think they'll pay it. I think that's quite messy. I think parents would want it, but I don't think at that price. I mean, how much are they going to put in to warrant a percentage and a $2.50 fee? Yeah, they could, they could put in $400 at one shot and only pay for one time. But Dr. Alfano also mentioned it's a double dip. Parents pay and then we have to pay, my correct? No, 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 no. One only one. No, I, one time but, fee. But Dr. Alfano, if I'm correct, Dr. Alfano, you were trying to say is when we go to collect our money that's owed to this internet service, are we charged to fee no, also? No, no, but no. one time fee. Okay. Well, what would be the downside if you went with it and then only five parents used it? What, only five parents use it. And it doesn't cost us anything and make sure you pay. So it cost us anything. If the parents want the convenience, why So not? is there anything to lose to try it? No, why do you, it, it, we post it online and ask people to see yeah. if you get the kind of response you get. And, I mean, so it, would it, the com if we don't get a good response, would the company just discontinue us? I mean, no, there, there's no, no risk, no minimum. Right, and then we have to decide who, what company we want to go with. No, online service is the one. Um, oh. the, the one I only have one proposal. Just like you do, it's like what you do with your college kids. You, know, right. you yeah. put money yeah. on their card and they swipe it. And yeah. Yeah. But I don't pay a premium. Right. It's built in somehow. Well, sure you're, you're paying a premium. 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 This company is just honest enough to tell you that they're doing it. Okay, okay. This is the Andrea. Do they have a card and it works on our Kamala? I believe it works off of a card with our Kamala. Now, what, 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 Shelley what, talked about it when we were here. So this would not, this would, how would this impact students that are reduced meals or no meals? And, you know, you wouldn't know the difference. Well, obviously, a free meal, the child doesn't. Does well, they just punch them up with any other. Reduced meal. Okay, I say we press on to the 2010-11 budget calendar. Right. So that's yours, right. too. So that's a, yeah. we're saying no to that, then. No for now. No for now. Just 2010-11 budget calendar. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I sent out one key component of our budget development is uh, building needs. Uh, I'd like to know what, if we can start looking at that with the buildings and uh, find, uh, the buildings and grounds committee. And also, um, if you're in a year where you don't have a contract, and for me to develop a budget for next year, uh, I guess I need the personnel committee also to make recommendations on a salary number for the budget process, so I can start uploading. Oh, the early we start this. Earlier we start this today. Well, that's why I'm asking if, if the committees can yeah, give, well, give Dr. Alfano and I some dates when they can start meeting so we can start the process, not necessarily this evening, but so we, we want to start the committee and buildings and grounds. Those are probably the two key okay. at this point. Mr. Rashad, if you can get a hold of the, and maybe we can knock them off his head together. You know, I really will both I'll contact Mr. Clark and Mr. Lembo. Uh, Just CC me Congress. on that email because if we can do something together, you know, because I'd probably sit on both of them. Very good. Right. Okay. Next one, it's the solar energy alternatives. We, the, the board was uh, brought to our attention about a company called BSC about uh, putting solar panels on a, a, a lease basis on our roofs. Uh, I, I spoke with Mr. Jay Cornell, who's the borough engineer's uh, employee of CME, if he could uh, do an analysis and forward a letter to you, which he did on September 23rd. Everybody should have got a copy of the letter. Um, and I, um, I know Jay uh, Cornell well, I work with him on the planning board, and I certainly value his opinion as an engineer. There's two things of concern in his analysis um, that I clued in on. One of them is, is, except for the Truman School, the roof area proposed to be utilized is not sufficient to accommodate their proposed system. So the systems they're proposing, CME is saying it's not going to be suitable for the roofs. And I, I saw that comment in, in writing, um, and I can tell you with BSC, they they indicated to uh, Mr. Pantoliano and I they were going to more or less do like a Google kind of search, and they know our buildings, and that's why the buildings that were selected, they felt that the roofs were sufficient for the system they were providing. But again, that that's coming from a layman's perspective. Right. When you get engineers in a room. Right. Now, Mr. Mr. Cornell is not talking about the structural integrity of the roofs, but the area. I, I understand that, but their, their indication when they came they inspected our roofs, and that's how they came up with the approval. The other concern I have with Mr. Cornell's analysis is that he said this is, he did his research. This is a new company that has no other projects like this that we can base on or check any references. Right. Um, and I didn't I didn't move forward with references because it really wasn't going anywhere. So if the board wishes, I can. But at the point in time when the board said no, I, I just left it as a dead issue. Didn't pursue it any further. Okay. 
And then he also brings up the question about public law contracts and going out to the sole source. Oh, that's a whole another round that we will move into. Okay, so I, I guess from the board, did, did you get the letter? Copy the letter? Did, did you all read it? What, what do you think? Is this something we need to press on with, or? Not the, I, I don't uh, suggest we go for the leasing of it. Uh, anyway, certainly there's too many right. there's too many question marks in, in this. And as far as solar energy, wholeheartedly yes, but I think the board should explore financing options to own the system ourselves. Absolutely. I think that would be the better long-term savings to the taxpayer. Well, the, the key component is, is that uh, when you purchase it, you have to fund it up right up front, right. and then submit for all your rebates and all, and, and that's probably the bigger issue that you deal with because you have to somehow come up with your capital money ahead of time before before you do it. And you're looking at an $11 million cost, and I, I think with $11 million, there's a lot more we can do with our current infrastructure than with solar panels on roofs. That's just my feeling. Uh, anybody smacking on? Again, I reiterate about the land associates, when they proposed their contract to the board, they had a solar uh, proposal within their bidding when they bid it for the contract, the, the DR architect, Mr. DeAndre can get a copy of that. I believe that's still on file. I don't have that any longer. Uh, I can look at it, but again, if, if you're looking to bring that their proposal indicated that you wanted them to do, there's a fee associated. Well, I mean, the, uh, the original proposal that they submitted to us with their uh, proposal to be our architect, they had a proposal for solar yeah, they energy said they, in there. If we, can, if we can all have a copy of that just to see. Well, they said they do. They didn't provide us with the proposal didn't give us any full, full blown. Uh, no, it wasn't. But I believe that there was a number that they said encompassing the high school at that time, if I'm correct. Yes, but I, again, I, if we're going back two and a half years. They would have to come in and do a full survey of your, of the district to come up with a similar proposal as BSC. I mean, if you're looking to move in that direction, I have no problem. But you, you have to understand, there's a major commitment of money that has to be made by this board to move in the direction of solar panel. And if that's what you're looking to do, I'll, I'll bring land on and see if that's the process. But it doesn't make sense to get land moving if we're not looking to do solar. Well, if, if, obviously, I, I don't think this is something we're going to put in the operation budget. I think if anything, you would do like many districts did successfully this past month is actually as a referendum. Was the $11 million just for Truman? No, that was the total, total cost. I believe it was. No, it was Truman. UES, high school. high school, and for some reason, middle school sticking in my mind, mind for some reason. And the last thing Mr. Cornell points out of concern is, is that um, their proposal does not address guarantees, insurance, potential vandalism, or access requirements. You know, if somebody says, hey, let's see if we can break that solar panel with this rock, you know, do we, are we responsible for that? Or? Well, I can tell you from the discussions I had with the gentleman, it's their system, they own it, they insure it, we're just basically leasing out they're, we're leasing their product, but they're putting it on our, on our property. It, it, it takes a long time, I'm sure, to get through the legal aspect of everything if you were to move in that direction. Um, and lastly, I, you know, before we, I, I think the analysis I would like to see is that how many districts that, I know Tom's River, uh, the, the one solar on a lot of buildings, um, if they're doing a lease purchase, so they just went out and financed this thing and are reaping the full benefit of the savings. I can tell you a majority of the school districts on their own, right. either through, mostly are doing it through right. front or end. Okay. Okay. So I think um, the last item I have here uh, is, is metal detectors. And the reason I put that on there was a board member had some concern and would like to discuss it, so I'm going to pass it over to that member to bring up any concerns. Yeah, I just had a couple of parents stop me when we were at the meetings for taking the polls out of the schools regarding safety issues. And they asked what was preventing us from having metal detectors in our schools. And I said that I would address the board with that. Well, if anyone has any input, just wait and say board it up. Sure. Um, after you mentioned this, I, I, I thought about it for some time. Um, and I thought about having experience in being on, on certain government facilities that have these things. Um, the logistical problem of getting 1,700 people to metal detectors. The other question I ask myself is the justification. I spoke to Mr. Jim Brown. I asked him since his tenure, has he seen any situations that he was concerned about weapon-wise, um, the need for um, metal detectors? And he, he said there were none. There was a couple of situations where 
uh, student had a, a box cutter, but they worked in the factory or something, had it in their pocket, in their work pants, and it was fell out and stuff to that effect. But not some uh, weapon that somebody brought to harm. I'm not saying that that means our, our schools are 100 percent uh, secure either. But I think the thing that really swayed me when I started to think about this was the perception issue. Um, you know, people coming from out of town, coming to our basketball games, our wrestling matches, uh, and see metal detectors in Sable schools. I don't, I don't know if that's a good sign. You know, especially. Uh, well, it's reality. It, you know. Yeah, I think it is reality in, in some districts, um, but I don't know if Sable is in, in that situation. That's just that's just one man's opinion. Uh, you right. know, um, that I just just threw out there. Mrs. Kilcomes to mentioned about property values. I don't know if metal detectors are on schools. Would, would be a bad thing. But I'm sure it's any Mr. McEnone, uh, if you recall, we had that hundred thousand dollar grant. Right. We had, right. uh, yeah. yeah, we had uh, the Officer Cox and uh, 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 Officer Sloan came in and did really an analysis of the buildings who were the at that time were the juvenile officers that were here for many many years and worked with Mr. Brown, his vice principals, and so on and so forth. And they really pushed hard for cameras. And I want to thank the board. We also put on two additional security guards as a result. We do have wands. We use them occasionally uh, if, if, you know, obviously there's a, there's a concern. Um, logistically, it would be a nightmare if we did it. Um, I don't know if everybody's gone through the airport, you know, and, it's, and probably 50% of the, the, the students would be stopped and have to be wanded. So, um, I thank God, in, in all honesty, that in, in my opinion, we're not at that point. Um, but I think logistically, we would have to literally take a half hour just to get the children into the building. Um, and in the, um, the unfortunate situations that, that occur, the biggest factor that people are concerned about is that uh, emergency management or parking lots that students hide stuff outside windows, that they won't walk through a metal detector. It's, it's you know, if somebody, God forbid, wants to do something in your building, um, you know, I, I think they're not going to walk through a metal detector. Um, that's my opinion. Um, I don't think it's really a deterrent, I think, I think at this point. And uh, Al Cox and uh, Rich Sloan really did um, a, a how many cameras do we have in this building now, Claire? Do you, what you said, like 50 to 75? I mean, yeah, I and uh, and and really, the two of that additional security guards has really made a, a big difference. Um, the board approved the dean of discipline, which really has helped, an attendance office that has really helped. I think human bodies are are, are the best in all due respect, and. Uh, um, in the middle school, I know, uh, I don't know if Donna's still here, um, but I had talked to her, I spoke to her, and I said, you know, we, we also have SRO officers, which we have, we have officers in the building that uh, constantly monitor what's going on. I, I think it's a, this is a valid discussion. I know we, we don't live in the abstract, we live in the real world, and, and you, you listen to the news, and, and I mentioned this uh, several times about, you know, the, the one-room schoolhouse in Amish country, what happened there, who would have thought that would have been dangerous for children. So, you know, I, you know, any other board members have any thoughts? Or anything? I don't think they would be warranted in our district. That would create, like you said, create more, uh, more hardships in, in dealing with it. No cell phones. Kids couldn't have cell phones. Cell phones. Yeah. That might be a cell phone site. <laughs> <laughs> you know. No keys. Anything, yeah, anything that would go off. That's, and, and they would have to be manned, too, I assume. You know, you have to have staff there early. Sure. Absolutely. Well, you'd have to, yeah. And you have staff go through it. You have visitors go through it. What doors do you put them at? I and mean, I just thought, when she brought this up, it's a lot of good exercise of thinking. You know, how, how, how do you logistically do it? You know, if I was a kid and I knew I had metal detectors, so I'd come after school at sports practice, put something in my locker, and the next day retrieve it. You know, I mean, I, I know I've been in, you know, some government studies where, you know, how, how do you spoof um, metal detectors in, that stuff. And are you, gonna put, are you going to put one on every door? Yeah, I don't know. I would say the entryway. Like where the 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 but door. as soon as they know they're there, yeah. they're, yeah. if they wanted to, they'd come in another door. I just said after school, it would be easy. All right, so you, you're against them then? I, 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 I'm not saying I'm against them. I, I just don't see the justification right okay. now. Well, I'm, I'm not, you know, not saying that. I have to answer. Well, absolutely. No, I think that's okay. a valid thing. And I think we need right. public service when they have a concern and we discuss it.
Last thing I want to make, it's not on the agenda, but I just want to ask Ms. Backo uh, about the polling. Um, uh, all the, you, you've collected all the signatures from everybody that went to the back to school night. Yes, I got them. And you're going to bring those time. that night. And Again, for the public, uh, you know, we're trying to get as many people here uh, in a democracy to go there. Um, I think, I, I'll tell you right now, uh, I'll be honest with you, I, I think, I think the, uh, it's stacked against us. I think the fix is already in. Uh, um, you know, that's what I feel. But the bottom line is, Mr. Backo uh, spoke about this eloquently last time. She said, you know, we need to know that we gave it our best shot, that we voiced uh, what it has to, be, has to be done here. And I think if we had other people behind us, it would be very smart on their behalf, especially considering the timing. Um, but um, it is what it is. But I think um, I have a moral and a uh, uh, legal responsibility to keep our schools safe. And it just doesn't make sense to have people come in that are not part of the educational process. And my philosophy is to go there and ask the freeholders um, for their help uh, and then see what they say and their justification of why they cannot help us. So um, the more people that have come, and I know, and if we have 200 people, um, I, I'm going to be the first to speak, and I'm going to mention that every one of these people are going to utilize their five minutes. So this could be seven hours, or we can end this in 15 minutes. So um, it, it's up to them. And, and, and um, I'll tell them that you know we didn't advertise this as a, a town hall meeting on health care. That's not why everybody's here. So they're here because they want your help. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try that approach. And then if all else fails, we will use the nuclear option, and that will have Mrs. Kilcummins come up to the microphone. <laughs> we'll call that the nuclear option, and we appreciate the help. So, um, at this time, I'll open it up to the public. Wait, just, yeah, I'm oh, sorry. I just have one simple question yes. I wanted to ask before. Um, in driving over the South River Bridge, and I've been to Athens a while ago, I keep forgetting, I noticed that our student's picture has gone off the billboard. What happened? No idea. Student no. picture. No. Yeah, remember we had that nice picture truck. of the bricks and there was yeah. a student on board when he came yeah. over and now it's gone. We don't control that. Yeah. Oh, so that it just board. disappeared. It was a contest that right. the people who have the billboard, you know, sponsored and I, I guess that's why it's gone. Our time is gone. Oh, so we we don't get the picture, we're done. So I thought that was uh, that was or, or Curtis, or something. I thought Curtis. 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 Yeah, Curtis. 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 If I want to ask Curtis, because Curtis, Curtis and Pete were on it or something that a while back. I don't remember. Because I remember you had asked us a while back about the billboard. Did we want to keep it? I thought that was there's the billboard. There's a sign that the Boy Scouts, on right. an annual basis, right. redo right. and paint right. and something of that nature. Right, but that wasn't the picture. That was the frame, I thought. I know what we voted. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it was the people on Curtis. Okay, at this time, uh, I'd like to open up the public for any business that may come before the board. If you'd like to speak, please come on up. If not, I just want to remind everybody that this Friday is our homecoming. Our sayable football team has a record of four and zero. Um, a lot of festivities happening on Friday. If you want to come down, appreciate it. And the staff barbecue. Uh, Ms. Bloom, if you can go ahead and send an all call email out again to remind everybody. And our own Mr. Emilio and my Italian friend Mr. Pasquale Lembo will be the chef. The best hot dogs you're going to find here. At this time, I'll take a motion for adjournment.